despite the fact that a lot of leftists and the propagandists try to make hijab look like oh it's just a scarf and if it is just a scarf nobody would really care right so a lot of times you know uh, hindu women or even a lot of uh, tribal women from places like rajasthan and other places they would sometimes cover their head but why why do we not uh, get alarmed when they do that and why do we not get alarmed when a hindu woman uh, wears uh, the bindi or sindoor or bangles or anything what really does the hijab symbolize uh, most importantly the hijab is also about the exploitation and the oppression of non muslim women Okay. why are you hindus uh, bothered about it why don't you let the muslims reform it themselves well if the muslims had done it we don't have to be doing it today right if the muslim community had taken the initiative to modernize and if those women are also now aspiring to become uh, pilots and uh, uh, engineers and uh, accountants and not wearing the hijab this conversation won't be happening an admission from aisha that an ordinary goat yet the quranic verse i just wish the wives of prophet muhammad had raised a lot of goats and they had eaten all of the quranic verses we wouldn't have had islam and then the muslim women could have enjoyed more freedom today but this also goes on to prove that allah is not really almighty but the goat is more powerful than allah okay goat is called bakra right and uh, instead of saying allah akbar that <laughs> Uh, namaste and uh, good morning good evening everyone and all of you are aware of the background of what is going on in karnataka um, there is a hijab controversy there is a small group of girls who originally started insisting that they would wear the hijab this started on the 27th of december last year uh, so this started in a small pre university college pre university college is 11th and 12th grade in karnataka so these are 16 17 year old kids so about five or six of those kids started insisting that they will come to the class wearing the hijab however all these years uh, in that same college they had a rule and uh, based on all the research and inquiries have done those rules have been in existence for more than 20 22 years so the rule was uh, nobody can wear any head scarf or hijab or covering the face and all of these things inside the classroom so muslim girls if they came wearing the burqa or the hijab to the school then they will change it take it off before they entered the classroom and then the school has lot of the video recordings and uh, uh, everything and uh, however on 27th of december it changed a small group of girls insisted that they would wear the hijab and this started spreading to a few other colleges and this got politicized so what really is going on here so what i want to do is i want to start with uh, a brilliant interview uh, by uh, maria shakil uh, she interviewed um, uh, shri uh, arif mohammad khan uh, sahab so he is the govern- governor of kerala but most importantly uh, he is also a quranic scholar and an expert on islam and very importantly on the islamic community in india okay? he has been very very concerned almost over the last 35 years or so about improving the plight of muslim women the muslim community itself in india and how to modernize them and how to increase their well being that has been his entire obsession and a very noble obsession i would say so just to give a little bit of context here uh, arif mohammad khan saab was one of the ministers uh, in the rajiv gandhi cabinet when he was a very young man he was at the time 35 or 36 so this was year 1986 and uh, most of you may not be aware of what happened then so let me give a really quick brief so there was a very elderly muslim woman by the name uh, shahaban she got divorced okay by a triple talaq by her husband and then she was extremely poor and then she uh, asked for uh, maintenance okay, some form of alimony some kind of maintenance for her to survive and uh, her husband refused because according to islam they don't have to provide alimony so uh, then she went ran from pillar to post finally went to the court and court came up with very small token alimony which was something like 500 rupees a month okay then this turned into a huge controversy uh, the mullahs um, uh, started mobilizing the people and then they started gathering people by hundreds of thousands okay across the country everywhere there were protests and uh, rajiv gandhi Uh, caved into pressure 
okay pretty much what he did uh, this is a point you know arif mohammed khan sahab makes uh, rajiv gandhi he was a very modern man himself however uh, for real politic he caved into pressure even though congress had more than 400 mps in the parliament uh, they simply overruled the supreme court judgment and threw this woman this elderly muslim woman under the bus okay and uh, since then uh, the entire uh, islamic community rather than modernize has been going more and more uh, into uh, under the control of the mullahs and under the control of some of the most medieval practices in the community so in 1986 uh, arif mohammed khan who was at the time 35 or 36 he resigns okay he leaves congress okay, in protest and it was not a protest for just staying in power but it was a protest for values okay so pretty much he threw uh, sacrifices his entire political career by quitting so <clears throat> that's the background of arif mohammed khan and uh, recently uh, maria shakil interviewed him and that's an interview everyone should watch in its entirety so i'll give a very brief summary of what arif mohammed khan talks about but he starts with a very good question he said why this controversy now he asked these girls have been coming without hijab and without face covering okay we'll talk a little bit more about the nuances of hijab in a minute but he asked the question these girls who are children okay who are innocent children who are 16 who are 17 they were attending the classes like everybody else and there are cctv videos that prove that point however all of a sudden over the last couple of months they have been making this an issue okay they have been saying if you are not allowed to wear the hijab if you are not allowed to cover our faces then we will not attend the classes okay so why and then he brings up the point he says uh, the popular front of india and a few other radical organizations have been brainwashing these children okay so i think the background this is what happened there is an organization called popular front of india uh, which is an offshoot of simi a banned terrorist organization and lot of the office bearers of simi uh, once it was declared terrorist organization uh, started a new one called the pfi or popular front of india and popular front of india is a banned terrorist organization in the state of kerala uh, and the high court of kerala upheld the judgment and over the last few months many indian states have been appealing to the center to ban pfi because of its terror activities and to give a few examples in uh, kerala pfi has been right behind the radicalization of the muslim communities in the northern coastal belt of kerala second many members of pfi uh, have joined the isis in syria and iraq and they have been fighting there and many of them have been arrested and when the police uh, when the kerala police raided uh, pfi premises and arrested a lot of their members they discovered they uh, found everything starting from bombs to rifles to other weapons okay so pfi has been a terrorist organization has been indulging in terror activities for a long time has been supplying um, recruits to isis and al qaeda okay over the last 6 or 7 years so this is the background and once the center started plans to ban pfi just as it had banned simi pfi floated a new organization called the campus front of india the campus front of india is focused on teenage children particularly muslim girls who are studying in high schools so this is how the campus front of india or cfi uh, started reaching out to this pre university college girls in udupi uh, with the argument that uh, you are not living like muslim girls and you have to uh, and you are imitating the behavior of hindu girls by not wearing the hijab by uh, just uh, uh, living and dressing like them and hence you have to radicalize yourself okay so this is a very good observation that arif mohammed khan sahab makes he says a small group of radical islamic organizations have been trying to radicalize the muslim girls and that's why they have started wearing the hijab so at the very outset uh, the first question we have to ask is uh, when somebody says this is a matter of choice this is not a matter of choice this is a matter of uh, some of the most radical muslim groups abusing the trust of innocent teenage muslim girls who are barely 16 or 17 and brainwashing them into believing that hijab is what should define them hijab is what should symbolize them and if it comes to choosing between the hijab and going to school and studying they should choose the hijab 
okay this is a brilliant observation that arif mohammed khan saab makes then towards the end of the interview arif mohammed khan saab makes a very important plea to the interviewer he says i am the governor of kerala and as governor of kerala i am also the chancellor of 15 universities in kerala and in the last few months i have attended four or five convocations across various universities and in these convocations 74% of the medal winners in colleges or girls and the percentage of muslim girls who are medal winners is no less than the percentage of hindu christian or any other girls studying in these colleges and then he makes a very good point i just came back from a veterinary college convocation and in that convocation um, there was only one boy and every other medal winner was a female including muslim females and he said i used to always think that in veterinary you won't find a lot of girls because uh, veterinary is a, a tough subject uh, you know it you have to deal with animals you have to perform surgery and all these things so you won't have a lot of girls but he was absolutely surprised to find out that uh, most of the medal winners are not boys there's just one boy and everyone is a girl then he makes an appeal he says do you want to push all of these muslim girls into the medieval age do you want to push them back and confine them to the four walls of their homes or do you want them to progress he closes his argument with only one question please have a heart think of those muslim girls they are also children like hindu girls christian girls jewish girls anyone else i think this is the context we have to start with uh, the context is not about um, uh, you know is hijab a choice those all of those questions can be easily answered and it can be easily refuted but the most important point that uh, arif mohammed khan makes is it has taken extraordinary amount of effort for these girls to uh, embrace modernity to go to college and to become medal winners and is it even just is it even reasonable to push them back into the medieval age by citing a text or a tradition from 1300 years ago 1400 years ago which is quite unsuitable and barbaric in modern age and this is where i want to set the context and uh, arif mohammed khan saab makes a very good argument he makes an argument that uh, the word the word hijab occurs seven times in the quran but then it does not mean the face covering or even attire in any one of those things and then instead he says that uh, the hijab is not essential to quran uh, and the women don't have to wear it that's the point he makes i do not entirely agree with him i'll talk about it why uh, but i agree with the spirit of his argument i agree that it's a very noble argument he is making and his argument is not wrong i'm just going to point out there are two different Uh, sets of jurisprudence within islam and uh, islam has not been really static in the past but over the last few centuries it has regressed it has become more and more conservative and it has become more and more unreasonable and it has enforced more and more of restrictive practices on women that's the important point i'm going to make and what i'm going to do is i'm going to share only three or four slides during the course of the conversation we just set the context of what is the background of the sente hijab controversy the background is it's not that the girls initiated this process it's not that somebody decided to say hey look i am going to wear a pair of jeans or i am going to wear this t-shirt or i am going to wear this hijab tomorrow it's rather a group of uh, muslim radical organizations islamic radical organizations have been abusing and brainwashing these children and that's how this entire controversy started what really is hijab right so i want to start with the definition of uh, maulana wahiduddin khan uh, so he was one of the most respected scholars uh, from india and he was an islamic uh, cleric he has written a lot of books and one of the books he has written is hijab in islam and uh, maulana wahiduddin khan was not a, a liberal or a modern person or anything right he is actually a very conservative muslim okay and then a learned person learned in uh, islamic texts traditions and its jurisprudence and his objective is not to reject the hijab okay he is actually explaining what really hijab means according to the quran and the hadiths okay and he goes through all of these things and he summarizes and what does he do he depends on 
the uh, he act this book hijab in islam is actually a translation of another book written by a, an albanian uh, islamic clergy a highly respected islamic clergy by the name muhammad nasiruddin al albani that's why he's called al albani and then uh, uh, wahiduddin khan summarizes all of these things there are eight attributes that make a hijab okay i have highlighted the top 3 however hijab unlike what most people think is not just the head scarf that's a completely incorrect understanding of hijab hijab literally means a screen okay uh, the very first thing it says is uh, and and then there are many many types of hijabs okay there are something like 29 30 types of hijabs you know uh, the khimar the jilbab the burqa uh, the parda as we call it then the simple head scarf are all different types of hijabs that's why in the karnataka controversy uh, there is uh, this girl uh, who Uh, was shouting allah akbar when you look at it she is not just wearing a head scarf she is wearing a black robe that covers her from head to toe only a small portion of her face is revealed but you will find most of the muslim women who are wearing uh, this or not even showing their face they will just uh, have two holes in their face uh, for their eyes that's it uh, on on the on the burqa for their eyes but the top three observations that uh, maulana wahiduddin khan makes about the hijab is first one uh, the concept of hijab is it's a screen okay and it means the entire body should be covered for a woman not for the man and then uh, all of the except the exempted parts the exempted part is the outer clothing and parts of the body that cannot be really covered even when you wear the full burqa uh, which is your eyes okay your eyes may still be visible but apart from that everything should be covered and then very particularly uh, they have to cover the hair okay showing the hair uh, is considered haram and they have to cover it and this always uh, puzzled me because if allah is so obsessed with hair and if he thinks that if a muslim woman shows her hair uh, that will be tempting to a man then he should create all the muslim women bald or men blind but on the other hand what he has done is to uh, create them with uh, beautiful hair and given eyesight to men and so that they can all get tempted then to insist that women should now go and wear the burqa they should go and wear the hijab and that to me sounds very unreasonable so uh, second point uh, which is point number 6 the bold one which uh, wahiduddin khan sahab highlights is that uh, any form of dress the woman is wearing <clears throat> should not resemble that of men and the point right after that uh, the hijab should not resemble that of non believers so at the core of it what this means is that women Uh, muslim women cannot resemble non muslim women and two they should be isolated by putting on the screen and uh, 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 so that's what hijab effectively is so this one is one of segregation the hijab at the core is a concept that segregates muslim women from the rest of the community from other women as well as men and uh, from their normal day to day Uh, walks of life and everything they could do whether they can study whether they can go and join the police force whether they can become pilots all of those are disallowed to them because hijab is a symbol of segregation and hijab is intended to segregate muslim women from non muslim women that's the very first thing about uh, hijab and a very important observation that uh, maulana wahiduddin khan uh, explains so despite the fact that a lot of leftists and the propagandists try to make hijab look like oh it's just a scarf and if it is just a scarf nobody would really care right so a lot of times you know uh, hindu women or even a lot of uh, tribal women from places like rajasthan and other places they would sometimes cover their head but why why do we not uh, get alarmed when they do that and why do we not get alarmed when a hindu woman uh, wears uh, the bindi or sindoor or bangles or anything so i think here is the difference so uh, the difference is um, uh, uh, you know uh, when a hindu woman does not wear a bindi okay or she does not wear the gungat okay or any of these things she is not being punished okay she is not being stoned to death okay nobody cares really maybe somebody in her family would say hey we are going to the mandir today why don't you wear the gungat or can you please wear the bindi that's it but most of the time they can just say no and they can move on nobody is going to punish them however muslim women are often punished and abused and vilified when they are not wearing the hijab so recently there was a 
Jordanian court judgment in which uh, it equated women who do not wear the hijab with sluts. And just think of what happens when a young girl is brought up. Okay, uh, let's say this girl is seven or eight or ten year old girl. She has not had any life experience, and she's just beginning to inquire about world, about life, and explore all of these things. And she is told, if you do not wear the hijab, you are a slut. Okay, her mind is already polluted. Her mind is already poisoned, and now she is made to feel guilty. Okay, if she were to now go and wear yoga pants and then uh, go and become an athlete, she would feel terribly guilty because now she is exposing her hair, she is exposing her face, her limbs, everything to non-Muslims, and even more importantly, she is now beginning to dress like non-Muslim women. All of this is forbidden by Islam, forbidden by uh, the Sunnah, because uh, that's where you know I have to slightly disagree with uh, Arif Muhammad Khan Sab. I think he. makes a very noble attempt he quotes the quran and he says the quran does not mandate the hijab that is true okay the quran does not enforce the hijab however uh, there are verses in the quran that expect the women to dress modestly but muslims don't just follow the quran if they just followed the quran uh, you know uh, the hajj pilgrimage which is a pillar for islam um, it's not mandated in the quran how many times a day they should pray which is again a pillar of islam is not clearly specified in the quran where do these things come from these things come from the sunna the sunna includes not just the quran but also reports of the conduct of prophet muhammad and then uh, it's based on the sunna that the rest of the islamic practices be it the jurisprudence or the sharia law or uh, their day to day practices everything is formulated based on the sunna and then the sunna actually mandates the hijab and that's where i have to slightly disagree with uh, arif muhammad khan although i completely agree with him in spirit so the first thing when a woman is not wearing the hijab the young child is brainwashed into feeling guilty okay she has to now think that she is either a slut or she is a terrible muslim and hence uh, uh, she has to she better start wearing the hijab but it doesn't stop there in lot of muslim countries those women who are not wearing the hijab are violently punished just a few months ago you'd have seen a report from afghanistan where the taliban uh, killed publicly executed a 20 year old woman her crime she wore a pair of jeans she did nothing else wrong she has not committed any other uh, sin or a, a crime or anything just like girls in india or the us or germany or anywhere she just had a desire to wear a pair of jeans she did that she was publicly executed and this is the case in lot of countries in iran uh, if you go back to 1979 in iran you will find during the revolution the women are very modernly attired today you will find all of them are forced to wear the hijab so hijab is something that is being forced upon muslim girls around the planet in many countries either through brainwashing either by making them feel guilty or by force as it happens in afghanistan iran and many parts of pakistan this being the case i think the very argument that islam is just a choice of attire is a terrible argument because the bindi or the gungat or the pagadi or the turban the sikhs wear all of these things are choice of attire because we know that lot of sikh youth are not wearing the pagadi right if you go to schools in the us there is a large sikh community in the us but how many school children are wearing pagadi very few most of the sikh children don't wear the pagadi and then nobody in the sikh community is going to execute them for not wearing the pagadi if the parents are orthodox they would say beta why don't you wear pagadi but at the end of the day the fact that in the schools you don't find that many pagadis even though there are a lot of children from sikh families actually tells you that nobody is being forced so i think this entire comparison is a disingenuous comparison there is a price a muslim girl pays for not wearing the hijab she is made to feel guilty she is vilified as a slut and in many places she is violently punished this is not the case with the gungat with the bindi bangles pagadi and all of these things and how do you make a choice to make a choice you should have explored various options if somebody said look i chose to become a chartered accountant then 
your first question is what else did you consider then the child would say hey you know what i thought of becoming a doctor i thought of uh, going to a business school or i thought of becoming computer engineer but what really excited me was uh, the subject of accountancy so i have chosen to become a chartered accountant when a girl says that we accept it as a choice because she has explored quite a few things and then she chose something which she likes on the other hand if somebody said uh, you are a girl you are not allowed to study computer science you cannot become a doctor and the only subject you are allowed to study is chartered accountancy nobody will say it's a matter of choice and uh, what is happening in karnataka so there was a 2015 study it was conducted by a team of muslim academics themselves they studied 960 madrasas across karnataka and these madrasas are not some fringe things and they have a large student body the largest of them has something like 1200 students and the smallest has something like 120 130 students okay. so these madrasas have been brainwashing a large number of muslim children for the last several decades so these authors pointed and by the way these authors are not even critical of the madrasas okay they being muslims and being conservative muslims they think that madrasas are a good thing but at the same time they are concerned that there is a negative perception about madrasas in society they want to change that perception so they are saying some of the perception is justified because there are problems in the madrasas what are those problems the problems are children are uh, caned okay they are beaten up okay when they don't uh, abide by the dictates that are issued in the madrasa and then these children are not taught modern education and think of it there is a 5 6 year old child that goes to madrasa and then she is given the option look either you obey everything that we are telling you even though these practices are oppressive and obscurantist or you will be caned what would the child do she will just obey and more importantly these authors point out in the first 4 to 5 years that is before the girl turns 10 these madrasas indoctrinate the child about all of the islamic practices and these are some of the most most conservative most regressive practices including wearing the hijab so these children were never allowed to explore options these children from a very young age from the age of 5 6 even before they turn 10 were completely brainwashed in these madrasas now not every one of the muslim child goes and attends the madrasa but this is the overall uh, culture uh, that um, becomes acceptable in the muslim community because a madrasa is considered to be a good place it's considered to be an ideal uh, place a, ro- a, a, a madrasa becomes a model center of education in muslim minds and when madrasas impose these regressive practices that becomes the norm in the muslim community so this is why muslim girls are not really making a choice when they wear the hijab these girls have either been brainwashed or have been made to feel guilty in uh, in the madrasas and in the islamic discourses and in many cases they also face violence and shunning uh, because a woman who doesn't wear the hijab uh, is uh, made to feel guilty and she is shunned a good example uh, i think a week ago or a couple of weeks ago the topper from kashmir the you know the high school board exam the 12th grade board exam is a muslim girl and she is not wearing the hijab and you can see the photograph and she got uh, vilified uh, in social media she also received death threats for not wearing the hijab and now uh, kashmir is one place where until 1989 or 1990 muslims were not wearing the hijab it would have been a very rare occurrence for someone to go and see uh, to 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 see a muslim woman wearing the hijab in kashmir before 1990 today exactly the opposite the hijab is pervasive and did those muslim girls make a choice no they did not what happened was there was a radicalization of kashmir in 1990 hindus were all expelled and then the mullahs and the radical elements took control of society and that's how the imposition of hijab happened so anyone who argues that hijab is a matter of choice just like you wear a pair of jeans or you wear sari or salwar or bindi or bangles is being absolutely disingenuous because they don't either understand how the psychology works when a small child is abused or they are just being dishonest and sometimes we are uh, 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 you know uh, offered the argument that all of this is fine but then 
the Muslim girls themselves say that they have chosen to wear the hijab. So that's what this girl, you know, who shouted Allahu Akbar uh, in in the in the college in Karnataka, she said, "I have chosen to wear the hijab." Okay. So the question, a uh, lot of leftists and a lot of other even even other genuine people ask is, "Well, they are saying that they have chosen to wear the hijab, and uh, why do you deny that? Why do you deny that it is a choice?" So that's why you know you see the image of a book. Called Under the Banner of Heaven. Uh, it was written by John uh, Krakoya. So this is about a Christian religious denomination in the U.S. called the FLDS. Okay, the FLDS Church. So there is a Christian uh, uh, sect in the U.S. called the Mormon Church, and I think the Mormons have also built a few churches in India now. I have seen one in Chennai. Probably there are others in New Delhi and other places. And this Mormon Church used to be one of the most uh, conservative and most regressive. among the christian sects and this mormon church had the practice of polygamy for uh, several decades until uh, they faced the heat of the us government and then they got a new revelation uh, which scrapped polygamy but not every mormon was happy with it okay uh, there were splinter groups one of them was the flds church the flds church said no we are breaking away from the mormon church because now they have got a new revelation to annul polygamy so we will found this flds church and we will practice polygamy and they practice some of the most obnoxious versions of polygamy where even a very young child is married off to a very old man and there have been instances where an old man will come and marry a divorcee as well as his daughter okay both the mother and child uh, will be the wives of a much much older man and lot of these people when finally the law enforcement cracked down on them uh, those girls said we have chosen to become uh, wives in this polygamous marriage but the rest of society did not agree with it the courts did not agree with it and the academics did not agree with it and rightly so because they all knew when you take a very young girl deny her exposure to rest of society modernity knowledge information and you do not allow her to explore choices and then you make her become one of the many wives a young girl marrying a very very old man then it's not a choice it's a matter of brainwashing and that's exactly what is happening with the uh, muslim community today and um, and and uh, in this case the very argument that uh, a muslim girl has chosen to wear the hijab even if she makes the claim uh, is a completely flawed assertion and what really does the hijab symbolize uh, most importantly the hijab is also about the exploitation and the oppression of non muslim women okay in some of the very earliest uh, islamic uh, narratives what we find is that uh, the quran says that a muslim man can marry up to four wives but he can take any number of concubines who are non muslims and these are called as what the right hand possesses so in the uh, in the quran uh, prophet muhammad himself led by example uh, in the quran and in sunna uh, muhammad wages lot of wars against others against non muslims against jews against uh, the pagans of arabia he kills their men and then he takes their women as captives he ransoms them and he distributes them to the warriors uh, who fought with them the jihadis who fought with them and then these women would become sex slaves okay they are what is called the what the quran calls what your right hand possesses and these women were expected to go topless okay they were only were allowed to wear a skirt uh, that went from their waist all the way up to their thighs but the rest of the body had to remain exposed why because so that a muslim man Uh, who is their slave master uh, and then can look at them admire their hair admire their face admire their uh, body everything and then uh, choose to have a conjugal relationship with them which is nothing more than uh, sex slavery uh, whereas a muslim woman on the other hand has to be screened okay has to be made to live behind the screen in the form of the hijab so the hijab is not only about the oppression of muslim women it is also about the exploitation of non muslim women in the islamic tenets in the islamic world view and this is what happened throughout history you know in india the historian k s lal uh, the late great historian he talks about the medieval period when muslims will wage war 
once they defeat a hindu king or a hindu settlement they will take the hindu women as sex slaves and they will march them across the hindu kush the name itself came that way right where lot of hindus perished by the thousands that became the graveyard of the hindus they would march those uh, defenseless women they'll take them to the markets of armenia or baghdad and sell them into sex slavery and when this happened uh, and why, and and why did this happen this happened because of what islam taught what the quran taught because these were what the right hand possesses and the hijab is not only about the oppression of muslim women but it's also a relic and a living reminder of the oppression and exploitation of non muslim women the next argument we are often uh, told is this is something that comes from the uh, leftists the mainstream media and everyone they will say oh by the way we also don't agree with the hijab but uh, why are you hindus uh, bothered about it why don't you let the muslims reform it themselves well if the muslims had done it we don't have to be doing it today right if the muslim community had taken the initiative to modernize and if those women are also now aspiring to become uh, pilots and uh, uh, engineers and uh, accountants and not wearing the hijab this conversation won't be happening okay this protest in karnataka won't be happening but the problem is the muslim community has failed to do that and the leftists starting with jawaharlal nehru in 1947 had the perfect opportunity to reform all these things legislatively because 1947 india had undergone a terrible partition and uh, that was the perfect time for nehru to say look uh, whatever happened we are colonized now we had the partition so many people died but going forward we are going to have a modern society and in this society we will have a uniform civil code and there is no place for sharia practices hijab and all these things uh, doesn't matter whether you are a muslim hindu sikh christian atheist that's your ideology that's your belief leave it at home when you are part of society be a modern person if you had done it that would have been so easy we won't have this problem today okay the leftists failed to do that the islamic community failed to do that and as arif mohammed khan often points out they have effectively handed control of millions and millions of muslims that's 15% of india's population something like what uh, 20 21 um, uh, uh, sorry uh, 200 210 million muslims so they have handed control of all of these people to the most fanatical most obscurantist mullahs Uh, islamic personal law board waqf board and all of these things and these guys are enforcing the hijab on muslim women these people are not allowing the muslim women to progress uh, become independent and you know explore life and increase their own well being with this being the case why should we just accept this argument uh, that only the muslim should reform from within when it has not happened in all of these 1300 years and if at all anything it has gone from bad to worse uh, professor shadi nazer is a professor of islamic studies and an expert at harvard university and then he talks at length about how different it was in some of the earlier stages of uh, islamic history so there is a quranic verse quran 1788 that challenges everyone okay all the uh, poets and everyone together Uh, can you produce a book like quran it's a challenge okay it's to me a ridiculous challenge because who decides okay um, what the parameters are and the, the quran doesn't stipulate the parameters but regardless the entire premise of this uh, quranic verse was this was revealed by allah to muhammad that's why this is the perfect book and nobody else can produce a book like that and there was a great scholar by the name abu al ala al mari okay and he is called the shakespeare of the arab literature he was a Uh, great literary giant <clears throat> and then he wrote a book called uh, paragraphs and periods and in that book uh, he produces a book like quran that's what the entire book is all about okay and then he publishes it and then this happens uh, in the 9th 10th uh, uh, century okay and at the time a lot of other muslims come and ridicule him hey almari you publish your book uh, your quran how is it doing what happened to that so there are a lot of sarcastic comments now pay attention they were not executing him for trying to do that whereas recently in northern africa a girl was thrown behind the bars for trying to produce a book like quran a surah like quran not even a book but 
going back thousand years almari was not beaten up almari was not executed he was not jailed and he said the rest of muslims uh, only uh, mocked him okay and then he gave he gave a brilliant answer he said just like your quran was polished in the mosques for 400 years you polish my book for 400 years in the mosque then it will become another quran in other words your quran has not attained its place of pride because it's a great book but it's only because you have been venerating it in the mosque you do the same thing to my book then it will also become uh, just like quran okay so now what you see is today those kind of discussions are absolutely uh, impossible uh, in india uh, or in anywhere in the world okay unless somebody wants to face islamic violence at the hands of terrorists then going back to even the 9th century about 100 years before almari wrote his book Uh, we have another person al shaybani uh, al hasan al shaybani and then he talks about uh, the hajj and women attending the hajj pilgrimage and he says it is not permissible for a woman to wear the hajj okay and then um, it's exactly the opposite of what uh, most of the muslims would be telling us today today you know the hijab the niqab and all of these things are forced on muslim women but then he says it's not permissible for you to wear that okay and he says don't cover your face and if at all you know you are really compelled to do that you know make it as minimal as possible okay so this was the attitude about 1100 years ago and al shaybani was not stoned to death or punished okay and uh, once again coming to the 10th century you find al maturidi and then he talks about it's perfectly okay for a muslim woman to show her face to strangers and these strangers are not just Uh, uh you know other muslims they could be anybody they could be unrelated women or men and he says other men can also look at these women provided uh, you know there is no lustful intention so in other words the entire thought here is you don't have to cover up but instead uh, don't uh, harbor lustful thoughts towards each other just because you are looking at each other so these are some of the attitudes that were uh, prevailing in islam Thousand years, thousand one hundred years ago. I am not going to through, go through every one of those points, but look at the picture to the right. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with what this is, but then there is an Islamic narrative about Muhammad uh, taking a nocturnal journey. Overnight, he travels to heaven and comes back. And how does he travel? He travels on a um, mythical horse called Burak or Barak. Okay, and then uh, he travels there and he comes back. And in Islamic Uh, history we are told that iconography or representing prophet muhammad or in general any painting is completely forbidden that's why uh, movies paintings uh, music and all of these things are haram in islam but what do you see on the right that is the painting depicting the nocturnal journey of muhammad to heaven and back on burak and uh, you find muhammad sitting on burak and not only that pay attention to burak Burak has a human face. It has the face of a woman, and not just any woman. She is wearing a bindi. Okay, she is probably a Hindu woman. Okay, and then he travelled and came back. Where was this painted? This was uh, painted in Lucknow, and it was painted in the 18th century, right after the time of Aurangzeb. And we all know that Aurangzeb was a tyrant. Aurangzeb was as orthodox or obscurantist a Muslim as one could get, and right after his time. in a society that would have been very conservative you could have a painting like this and nobody was executed but today a painting of this sort will directly invite the wrath of jihadis and you will get beheaded as it happened in uh, denmark as it happened in uh, france and other places so the broad picture what do we see here there islam was never a liberal religion starting from the very beginning hijab was something that was enforced upon muslim women to exploit them and to segregate them from non muslims the hijab is also a symbol of oppression of non muslim women because they had to go topless and they could be taken as sex slaves and they could be uh, sold into concubinage by muslim captors they had no rights but in the earliest phases of islam what we find is there were voices that could actually challenge this or- orthodoxy and not get punished for it but over a period of time islam has been regressing 
the Muslim community has been regressing rather than progress. And they have been surrendering all of their rights to the most obscurantist mullahs who don't care about the freedom of Muslim women. And that's why we are, we are experiencing the plight that we experience today. With that being the case, how reasonable is it to say that only Muslims can reform Islam when any attempt to reform Islam today will be met with violence, will be met with uh, abuse of Muslim women or even men who try to do those things. And that's why there are not too many Muslim reformers sitting in uh, Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or other places. Whoever wants to reform Islam, they are all living abroad in the Western countries. So that being the case, I think the entire argument that only Muslims should reform Islam from within is not just deluded, but it's really despicable. If we really care about the Muslim women and if we think they are no different from uh, Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Sikh or atheist women, and if we care about their well-being, then I think non-Muslims should take the initiative to reform Islam because Islam has failed to reform itself. Let's now come to this very important uh, argument. Okay. Is the hijab necessary to practice Islam? Okay. Arif Muhammad Khan uh, makes an argument by citing the Quran that it is not. However, as I pointed out, the Islamic practices and jurisprudence are not only based on the Quran. He is right about that. Okay, if you are only looking at the Quran, then it's not a mandatory thing. However, the Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic practices and beliefs are not only based on the Quran, they are based on the Sunnah. And the Sunnah makes it absolutely clear that a woman should wear the hijab. And as I pointed out, hijab is not just a scarf. And there are 29, 30 different types of hijab. And uh, the head scarf is just one of those. The niqab, the burqa, uh, the himar, and all of these things are different, different types of hijab. And it can very well be argued, and many Muslim uh, uh, jurists would argue that hijab is essential to practice Islam. Okay? While I recognize there are two different schools of interpretation, with someone like Arif Muhammad Khan, who is a Quranic scholar, saying that the hijab is not necessary, and others saying that the hijab is necessary, at the least we should recognize there are two different interpretations of Islam. So let's take the argument. Is the hijab necessary to practice Islam? And let's say it is necessary. So what? There are a lot of other practices of Islam which are absolutely essential practices. And uh, one of those is waging the jihad. Okay, The jihad is a fard. Fard is a religious duty. Okay, And uh, a Muslim is um, enjoined upon to, wear, uh, to, to wage jihad against non-Muslims and to spread Islam and to impose it. And the reward for fard is a place in heaven, an eternal place in heaven. And it's a religious duty. It's necessary to practice jihad. Do we allow that? Which Will any civilized society allow that? Or take the practice of stoning the adulterers to death? This is a very common sight in most Islamic countries, not just Saudi Arabia, not just Afghanistan. In many places, this punishment takes different forms. Sometimes it's brutal stoning. Sometimes it's jailing for years and years. Sometimes it's hanging by death and all of this cruelty. Okay, Because a woman committed adultery, adultery or she's alleged to have committed adultery. Now, the Quran does not have uh, this prescription. The Quran does not say that, the stone, that an adulteress should be stoned. Okay, uh, And if at all anything, it just gives um, Quran 59, uh, merely says, you know, that uh, they should be shunned for some time and then they should be uh, given a few lashes and those kind of things. Terrible in itself, but then it is not prescribing stoning to death. However, the Sunnah and then the rest of the Islamic jurisprudence endorses and mandates the stoning of the adulteress to death. Why is that? Because there are hadiths uh, revealed uh, uh, in the earliest stages of Islam and one of them comes from Aisha. And in that hadith, Aisha says, by the way, a Quranic verse was revealed to Prophet Muhammad. This is right after Muhammad is dead, right? Muhammad is dead and the funerary rites are being performed. And Aisha comes and says, uh, by the way, um, Allah revealed a verse to Muhammad where he recommended Rajam. Rajam is stoning to death for, the, for, for adultery. Rajam as punishment for adultery. However, uh, I had written down this verse on a small uh, papyrus, which is a small piece of paper. Okay? And I had put it under the bed 
upon which uh, Prophet and I slept. And then when Prophet Muhammad died, uh, we were performing the ablutions, washing the corpse and all of these things. Then a goat came in and it ate the Quranic verse. And this is a strange verse because, uh, you know, when you look at the Quran, the Quran in Quran, Allah says, uh, I have revealed the Quran and I have prevented it from all kinds of corruptions for all ages to come. But then what we see here is an admission from Aisha that an ordinary goat ate the Quranic verse. I just wish the wives of Prophet Muhammad had raised a lot of goats and they had eaten all of the Quranic verses. We wouldn't have had Islam and then the Muslim women could have enjoyed more freedom today. But this also goes on to prove that Allah is not really almighty, but the goat is more powerful than Allah. Okay, Goat is called Bakra. Right? And uh, instead of saying Allah Akbar, that girl who shouted Allah Akbar could have actually shouted Bakra Akbar because the goat is really great. And then uh, the goat ate the Quranic verse that enforced, that mandated uh, stoning the adulteress to death and by hailing the goat, she could have actually embraced modernity. But then she chose the less powerful God, uh, Allah being the less powerful. Now, today, and, and, and by Islamic uh, practices, by Islamic mandate, uh, stoning an adulteress is essential to practice Islam. Will any civilized society allow that? If Prophet Muhammad and Allah came back today, <clears throat> if they came to New Delhi and they said, Hey, this woman committed adultery, let us stone her to death. If they tried that, they would go to Tihar jail. And if they come to do that in the United States of America, they would spend the rest of their life in Supermax ADX in Colorado. That being the case, we should not worry about whether some practice is necessary uh, for, within, within Islam. The question we should ask is, is it a civilized practice? Does it have a, have a place? in today's world, in a civilized world? Is that practice harming Muslim women, Muslim girls, brainwashing them, abusing them, and exposing them to violence? Is that practice preventing them from making reasonable progress in society? I think that's the question we should ask. So let me conclude uh, before opening up for Q&A. In conclusion, uh, the simple argument to make is that uh, first and foremost, uh, the entire hijab controversy is the result of some of the most radical uh, Islamic groups like the PFI and its front CFI abusing and brainwashing defenseless girls who are 16 and 17, who were not wearing the hijab until last year and making them wear it and forcing them to choose the hijab over education. That's terrible. And number two, what we are also seeing is a trend where Islam has regressed more and more it has pushed the Muslim community into the dark ages over a period of time, over the last 11, 1200 years. And the semblance of reform that were possible in the earlier stages of Islam are no longer possible today. And the leftists, rather than reform Islam, they had the opportunity. More than 75 years, they've had the opportunity to legislate and modernize and give an opportunity to Muslim women to explore life and well-being. They denied all of those things. And those leftists don't have the moral authority to come and tell the rest of the world, especially Hindus, that we cannot go and reform Islam. And today, based on the historical precedent, the only way a reform is possible is when non-Muslims initiate it. And in the Indian context, with Hindus initiating it. That's the only way reforms are possible. And we owe it to the Muslim women. A Muslim girl uh, who is 21, 22, is no different from my own daughters. Okay, so that being the case, if I want my daughters to study and get the best of the education, and why should we deny it to the Muslim women? Why should we leave them to the mercy of the most obscurantist mullahs? And finally, the argument that the wearing of the hijab is essential to practice Islam. Uh, there can be two schools, the likes of Arif Muhammad Khan arguing against it, but many, many, many other uh, jurists arguing for it. I don't care. Okay. I will still ban it because it's uncivilized, it's barbaric, it's harmful to Muslim women. Thank you. I'm ready to take the questions. Uh, what is the linkage between them, this and the uniform civil code, or the scare that is there amongst the Muslims? Is this related? They are related. So this is something uh, Arif Muhammad Khan has talked about 
on many occasions. He has written about that on many occasions since 1986. Okay. So he makes a very good point in his interview with Maria Shakil. He says, Muslims are the first to get exposed to Western education. Okay, not the Hindus. In India, it was the Muslims who got exposed. Okay, but they issued fatwa okay, against those who are trying to modernize and educate Muslims. Okay, and then uh, these are not just ordinary fatwas. They wanted those people to be beheaded. Okay, so anyone who tried to modernize. And uh, uh, he talks about how uh, uh, this brainwashing happens within the Muslim community with all this uh, personal law board and others. And their entire argument is uh, that you uh, you're following the sharia and following all of the prescriptions of islam is what makes you muslim and then uniform civil code is a threat to that okay so uniform civil code is an attempt to impose hindu beliefs on and practices on muslims which is completely disingenuous that's something arif mohammed khan points out because uniform civil code is not a hindu civil code okay uniform civil code is just a modern set of codes uh, which is constitutional uh, which says, look, these are the right practices in a modern society. We should follow that. These are your freedoms. These are your rights, etc. And it is not Hindu, Christian, Muslim, or anything. But the Islamic community has been doing this for a, a, a the Islamic mullahs and the most obscurant elements have been doing this for several decades now. That Arif Mohan Khan talks about, and then their entire argument is they start spreading fear. The moment somebody challenges the practice like this, they say now they are going after Islam. Okay, they are preventing you from practicing uh, the core beliefs of Islam. And they are next going to impose uniform civil code, uh, which is actually an imposition of Hinduism on Islam. Okay, So Islam is under threat. So that's the narrative they produce. And are the two related? Uh, uh, yes, you know, uh, if you get rid of all the Sharia prescriptions, okay, for example, in, in Islam also mandates, Islam is a very prescriptive religion, right? So Islam mandates violent punishments for theft or any one of these things or for apostasy okay if you're if you're an apostate you can be killed and you should be killed these are mandate based on but in india muslims are not clamoring after those uh, criminal you know enforcement of those criminal uh, laws but they want it to be enforced for civil law because that's how they have been indoctrinated by the mullahs they are saying if you don't practice these civil prescriptions of islam then you are not a good muslim okay so but unless you abrogate all of these practices you cannot have a uniform civil code. And in fact, what is the consequence of abrogating all of these practices? That's a modern uniform civil code. Okay. It's a desirable thing, but then the mullahs and the you know, some of the leftists have been spreading this myth that uniform civil code is an imposition of Hinduism on Muslims. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Venkat, I beg to differ on a lot of things which you have said. Um, to start with, um, what I could hear you say uh, throughout your discourse was that, oh, these are innocent girls, they've been brainwashed and all of that. Now, that may be true. Neither you nor I know about it. Okay, we may have some um, other data points to believe that this is the case. However, what, what I wonder is, these six girls who you have talked about, they very well knew that if they say, no, I have to wear hijab inside, they may be asked not to enter the classroom or the college, which is what happened in subsequent days, which unfolded. Mm -hmm. These are the same set of girls who probably after a year would have decided the future course or the direction of their academic career. Okay. It is roughly of the same age where people, you know, Muslims have actually committed heinous crimes. Like you mentioned one of them in France where the 17 and a half year old boy just, you know, uh, cuts the throat of this guy over there in, in, in France. And can, and can you also keep it brief so that others can ask the question? Uh, can you come to the question? Sure, 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 sure. I'm just giving you examples where it contradicts. Okay. So what my whole point is that Unless they are really young age, like eight or nine years, right? One can say that, you know, that, oh, they have no brain of theirs and they are getting influenced. See, influence, each one of us get influenced by different, different Okay, so, you, so, so let, let, to let, what let extent? me, extent? Yeah, let, so, let, so me, let me summarize. Let me, just, let, me, let me just summarize. Give me one more moment. So my whole point is, I think we are trying to project these girls as very innocent and putting all the blame on 
so called mullahs and all while yes they should be held they should be held responsible but i am i'm saying these girls also knew the consequences they still know the consequences so many things have okay. happened there still i i i, I heard you. sorry yes i heard you thank thanks for the question so let me quickly summarize your question okay um, your question is that you disagree with my argument that these girls are brainwashed and exploited and then you are arguing uh, and you are asking are they really innocent okay so let me put it this way a girl who is 16 or 17 okay is a child first and foremost okay and i do consider them to be innocent okay uh, number one number two these girls uh, as i pointed out and this, and it's not an opinion okay as i pointed out uh, citing lot of these things including a study of 960 madrasas in karnataka and then the campus outreach done by uh, terror friends like cfi okay these are all documented uh, facts okay so all of these things you can take a young child and i have studied the way uh, totalitarian ideology spread particularly uh, religious ideologies like christianity and islam very extensively and how they can warp your world view and how they can change the way you think okay a normal person can completely abandon reason and rationality and start viewing everything through the prism of religion once they are brainwashed and i have pointed out citing lot of data points this is exactly what is happening and you don't even have to go go very far okay these girls were showing up without hijab until last year until the 27th of december then they changed so something happened in between okay and this something is that brainwashing okay so nobody who has tasted freedom just jumps into wearing the hijab and veiling themselves and shouting allah akbar and giving up their career until they are brainwashed and this is a subject uh, one doesn't have to really go into denial mode okay so uh, of course people are absolutely welcome to disagree that's the entire point of conversation because uh, uh, we don't want uh, anyone to bl- blindly accept anything but uh, all the points i made are pretty well backed up by extensive studies and data not only in india but across the globe and uh, uh, it takes uh and there is something in neuroscience in cognitive sciences there is something called uh, persuasibility okay it's called the criterion of persuasibility about which i have written my past books quite a lot there is something called um what what does this mean it means is until the age of 8 or 9 okay you can be persuaded quite a lot as a child but past this age your persuasibility starts to decline okay slowly declines until you turn 16 17 18 and all these things and it ends so when a child is taken and uh, brainwashed into the most obscure and islamic beliefs and i pointed out in the madrasas the children are brainwashed into that before they turn 9 or 10 okay so so they are first exposed to obscurantism when they are children okay when they are defenseless when they absorb all these things and turned into radical muslims and only then given a little bit of semblance of exposed exposure to modernity okay we don't have to go about denying that um sir i'm not that f- uh, familiar with the various books muslims follow and value so that's why my question is do Mus- muslims believe that the allah spoke out the sharia law is it part of the quran so most of the muslims have not read the quran uh, the hadiths or uh, or not even familiar with most of the sunna okay because uh, you know uh, arif mohammed khan uh, in his interview to maria shakil points out that something like 20 to 23% of the muslim women have never had any academic exposure okay so uh, the level of li- illiteracy among the islamic community is staggeringly high and this is not just a phenomenon within india but this is a phenomenon which is very global in most of the muslim countries they have had no exposure and even among the muslim men uh, they have not had much exposure to uh, any of the reading so most of them have do not even know what uh, islamic texts Uh, really teach so they are dependent on sermons in mosques and by other dawa guys and others okay so this is the first thing right most of them are not familiar so what they reflect is what they have been taught by these folks okay in their friday sermons and other things so what do they believe in the core belief is that allah revealed the verses of quran to muhammad and then those verses are Uh, preserved against corruption for eternity and those have to be followed ditto okay uh, and not only those verses those verses are now amplified by sunna okay which is the uh, you know 
acts, deeds, and words of Muhammad or words attributed to Muhammad, and they have to follow it. And only by following these things, one becomes a good Muslim. And the reward for being a good Muslim is you'll go to heaven. And one who does not follow all these things uh, becomes a bad Muslim and uh, or even an apostate. And then this person is condemned to hell. Okay, This is the core belief of most of the Muslims. And I'll give you one example. So a lot of times you'll find Muslim men are wearing a beard that's a fist long below their chin, but no mustache. Okay, And you'll also find they are wearing uh, trousers or pajamas. Next time you watch this Muslim apologist, Zakir Nayak, okay, he'll be wearing a suit, but look at his trousers. They will just stop above his ankle. And why is that? Because there is a hadith that says, in which Muhammad says, uh, he tells his uh, followers that uh, what is below the ankle belongs in hellfire. Okay, So, a completely absurd belief, and uh, uh, but that's what he teaches. And uh, in fact, I was... Uh, uh, joking about this uh, recently uh, somewhere, you know, uh, this was actually refuted by um, the Indian uh, Bollywood lyricist, you know, Gulsar. He wrote this uh, song, Chaya Chaya, some 20, 25 years back, where he said, Paun ke niche jannat hogi. Okay. So, Mohammed says, uh, 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 below your ankle is uh, in hellfire, but then Gulsar say, uh, refutes it by saying, below the ankle is your, or be below your feet is your is heaven okay anyway, anyway I, I was just joking about but then uh, but then you know this is the uh, core belief that governs uh, most of the muslims or literally all of the muslims that these are all revelations from allah and this is how they should live that's why this is one of the worst forms of mind control because they cannot even question these things thank you uh Kalevaiji and uh... It's so strange. They all latch on to this Shudra thing, you know, that the feet is the Shudra and this and that. And this is there in their Hadith. No, nobody yeah. talks about that, you know. Yeah. You know, in India, Hindus should take it upon them to, you know, reform Islam. Um, if, I, if, I, if I go by that argument, I, I personally do not agree with that, but that's a different story. But if I if I extend that argument, then Hindus should also agree and accept that somebody else, like for example, Christians should come and reform Hinduism. Oh yeah, got it, got it. I got your question, absolutely. So it's I, I always use what I call the principle of reciprocity. Okay. And if you have followed my writings and my speeches over decades, over the last two decades, okay, uh, I value reason above everything. Okay. Uh, we have to be absolutely reasonable and uh, uh, every religion can be evaluated and critiqued using the same yardstick of reason and uh, facts and sometimes even by relying upon science. Okay, And uh, this is applicable to Islam, this is applicable to Christianity, this is applicable to Hinduism. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a Sangam Talks I deliver where I actually do that, uh, use that yardstick for evaluating uh, Christianity. And uh, I know why you bring up this argument. So a lot of times, a small section of Hindu sphere who, if we point fingers at uh, Islam, then what if somebody else points fingers at us? Good, let them point fingers at us. But the beauty within Hinduism is, uh, because always our question is not to hide problems within our religion, okay, and then uh, stop pointing fingers at others, fearing that they would uh, expose our weaknesses. No. Um, any terrible practice in any religion uh, should be uh, critically examine and should be changed. But the beauty with Hinduism is a lot of these reforms have always happened within Hinduism. For example, uh, this is not a, even a new phenomenon. Okay, And I, I don't even want to use the word reform uh, because it's more of a critical thinking because reform is a very fundamentalist argument. It means reformation. Okay, So those things don't apply to Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. But in Hinduism, there has always been a very critical thinking where people have challenged norms that's why you look at Dharma Shastras. Dharma Shastras very clearly talk about it. You don't have a single Dharma Shastra. You have dozens and dozens of Dharma Shastras. And they talk about, and Manusmriti says this, it says, a practice or a law is dharmic so long as it increases the happiness and maximizes the well-being of everyone in society. And if it does not, then it should be abandoned and it should be replaced with something that's better. That's why you have multiple Dharma Shastras. In Hinduism, we have this rich tradition of examining our own religion and finding out whatever is wrong with it and changing that. And this, we don't even stop with ourselves. We even apply this to our divinities. 
For example, take the Ramayana. Take the Kamba Ramayana in particular. It's not a translation of Valmiki Ramayana, but it's a rendition in Tamil of the original epic that Valmiki wrote. And Kamba is a is a masterpiece. And in Kamba Ramayana, there is an episode where um, Vali is dying, right? And uh, you know, then he asks Rama. He tells Rama, "You are a Shatriya, and then you are a follower of Manu." Okay, that means you must have embodied every single virtue. Why did you hide behind the tree and fire the arrow at me? Shoot the arrow at me. He says, "Our Shatriya behaves." Okay, and look at the genius of Kamber. Kamber is putting Rama on trial right here, and Rama is divinity, but he is put on trial, and Rama is speechless. He doesn't have a response. Okay, he keeps quiet. Okay, and that's the moment of vulnerability for Sri Rama. Then. Lakshmana speaks up. Lakshmana says, uh, "The shastras also tell that when a shatriya, when somebody comes to a shatriya and says 'Abhaya,' meaning give me protection, he has to give it. If it doesn't, then he fails in his duty as a shatriya. Then he starts. You did something terrible to your brothers, to your own brother by abducting his wife. Then Sh- Shugriva came to Rama first, and he said 'Abhaya, okay.'" so give me justice and then rama had made a promise and rama had given his vow to shugriva saying that your brother vali did something terrible something heinous so i will uh, kill him and then i will restore justice for you and if he does not kill you then he would have not kept his promise to shugriva he would have failed in his dharmic duty and since you have this uh, uh, boon that whoever comes in front of you Uh, uh you will get half of the strength then he had no other option but more importantly what if you had also asked for abhaya okay so he had to shoot you okay now this is a very good uh, literary tool okay it's a brilliant uh, way kambar is handling the entire issue but what is going on here is that kambar is actually putting rama on trial and then he absolves him but we have this rich tradition and we don't have to abandon that and this tradition did not stop with kambar it has always continued and then you look at someone like shri narayana guru okay from kerala okay he was examining lot of the practices and then he was saying this is how we should deal with it and we have had this rich, rich tradition and so uh, i am sorry we don't have to abandon that and we don't have to become abrahamic houses i may have missed in your previous answer it's a follow up question so was the sharia law revealed by allah directly or did it was it created by muslims based on no, it was concept? it was it was created uh, based on sunna okay uh, because there are uh, verses in the quran which are revelations then uh, there are hadiths uh, that narrate the life events of muhammad okay so his words and deeds attributed to him and then the sharia laws follow that okay there are multiple schools of jurisprudence in, within islam uh, they sometimes vary with one another but those were created by the islamic jurists over the last 1300 years 1200 years or so okay so uh, venkat ji just continuing on the previous uh, question and the answer you provided see this is my uh, this is my point i think religion and it, to me i don't know if there can be a common yardstick against which all the religion can be measured you know in a fair manner because i think all these religions as we know today they are quite different from each other and it requires somebody to have very deep understanding of lot of things about all these religions to even come up with that now maybe it is there i do not know my information is not as wide spread and deep as probably yours so to me uh reforming a religion predominantly falls upon the people of that religion now others can of course nudge influence um you know the people over there to i, I, I right think thing. we already i think we already discussed that right i have cited almost 1200 years of islamic attempts where they have failed to modernize and where they have failed to reform okay and uh, so and let, let let me finish okay so now to just insist against all this evidence okay uh, i summarize lot of that and i can summarize ton of more okay and against all of this to blindly insist that i still believe the reform can only come from within i think is dogmatic but then more importantly look at it every single day this is propagated i don't think your daughters assuming you have some or wearing the hijab or 
or denied all their opportunities and freedom in life okay and we don't do that so should, we should have the same empathy for women of other communities because those girls who are 16 or 17 are no different from our own daughters okay and why do we hand them over to the most regressive elements within their own communities and not step in that's number one number two yes the same yardstick can be used for all religions because all religions are dealing with uh, temporal things and i'm a hindu and i'm also a practitioner of nirishwara darshana uh, which i roughly translate into atheism and uh, now but which is not an uh, accurate translation though but uh, the point is uh, within uh, um, uh, 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 so from from this perspective what is religion dealing with it, it deals with life death what happens in between the two and what happens beyond these are the questions that are absolutely uh, 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 common to all the religions okay and the answers they come up with could be different and these can be since they are dealing with the same phenomena they can all be examined using the same yardstick and in fact this is exactly what hinduism teaches okay hinduism has what is called a system of pramana pramana means instruments of knowledge you have different types of pramana in some case it is shruti pramana in some case it's anumana and all of these things but hinduism comes up with a system of uh, 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 pramana or the instruments of knowledge to evaluate a phenomenon okay, if you read one text after the other you take something like uh, gautama's commentary on the nyaya shastras or you take uh, jayanta bhatta's uh, text like nyaya manjari and others uh, they have spent uh, you will find literally thousands and thousands of pages of articulation on all these things okay and this is exactly what they say just because and in fact in a book called agamadambara jayanta bhatta the kashmiri uh, nayayika he makes a brilliant point he says um, every religion should be evaluated uh, whether it adds the well being of people or it harms people by using these yardsticks the yardsticks of pramana and then rejected or ridiculed okay this is hinduism okay this is what you are taught unfortunately a lot of hindus today are ignorant of all of these profound and the intellectual traditions within hinduism and they think who oh, you know uh, religions cannot be evaluated using a common yardstick absolutely wrong okay in fact in my entire book on christianity i dedicate literally dozens of pages explaining this concept why every religion can and should be evaluated using a common yardstick we don't do that because a we are ignorant of this common yardstick b we are ignorant of hinduism and its rich intellectual traditions c we are ignorant of christianity islam and other religions and then four uh, the hindu mind is still not at decolonized okay most of these people approach hinduism and say when they make an argument that who oh, you know how can we evaluate these religions we cannot do that that argument is effectively throwing in the towel uh, people throw in the towel because they are ignorant of all these religions no absolutely wrong we can use a common yardstick and i have made a very comprehensive case for those things and that's the rich hindu tradition as well and these are the questions a lot of people ask and i'm glad he brought them up because many times people will say hey why are we talking about other religions okay now and a lot of times it's it's actually a good thing because see what happens in hinduism uh, a lot of times you know folks like gandhi uh, popularized this notion of sarva dharma samabhava right so and many times we ridicule them but at one level it's also a good thing because uh, we hindus we don't have a single book we don't insist that there is only one path to divinity okay there is only one path to realization that's why we have a lot of rich hinduism is like a library we have a rich diversity uh, in terms of philosophy in terms of practices temple worship name it samskaras we have a rich diversity and this comes because we say look uh, i explore my tradition and i have gained some insights and i do not want to deny that to you okay so maybe you have insights from your own traditions okay this is the beauty of hinduism and then you know some of the 17th century uh, french travelers who come to india they always highlight this point that every hindu they have talked to says that you know we don't believe in universal religions okay we believe that a, a religion or its practice or philosophy or Uh, very very unique to an individual okay so we accept diversity so i think this is at the core a very noble and a very uh, rich thought because this is the best bulwark against dogmatism but the reason i also pointed out uh, with a contrary in answer is that we should also not fail to recognize that there are religions that are harmful there are religions that are beneficial okay so something like buddhism okay has the practices of 
a theory of mind or for example if you do mindfulness or if you do any other buddhist practice okay or if you follow kundalini practice okay within hinduism then all of these things um, are giving you an experiential path okay you can pursue this and you can come up with insights okay now uh, something like christianity or islam do not have these things okay they are dogmatic religions that harm people so that's why we should not fail to deploy the common yards to venkat ji see this is my problem uh, i don't know how a yardstick can be built which can compare a pluralistic religion like hinduism or sanatan dharma with a dogmatic religion like christianity or islam okay now very frankly you have given lot of example about hinduism on reforms thereof and and critiquing and all of that but if you see your example they all are from hindu pantheon okay and the problem here is that only that the religions are so different from each other to me a lot of them are like polar opposite to certain degree in certain senses and that is why i i just feel maybe it is my you know immature mind which cannot fathom that how they can be compared nonetheless i think in my opinion with this current hijab controversy coming back to your <laughs> the original topic on which you were talking so, so, about so let, let me let me answer that question so that we don't lose track of that right so take a simple question okay how did it come into existence here okay so how did everything originate okay so this is a question everybody has asked okay uh, the vedas have asked this question the rigveda say for example you know uh, what was in the beginning nobody knows not even gods okay so then this is the exact question that christianity asks okay but then comes up with a response saying oh by the way god created all these things okay islam asks the same question and it says allah created everything okay and modern biology or quantum physics asks exactly the same question but the answers they come up with are different okay so out of these we can very clearly uh, say one thing everybody is asking the same question everybody is dealing with the same phenomenon how did universe how did life originate but the answers they give are different the only thing we can say is that uh, quantum physics when it talks about big bangs and uh, you know multiverse and other things it comes up with a response that is enlightened okay that is informed okay when biologists come up with an evolutionary model to explain how life uh, evolved then they are coming up with an informed response okay when hindus say uh, in the rigveda when they say we do not know what existed what happened in the past okay nobody knows okay but what they are displaying is a very open mind to say there are questions to which we may not have answers okay and even gods may not have answers so let's not succumb to the temptation of revelation let's keep an open mind and explore okay that hindu mindset that hindu view would have led to quantum physics and uh, uh, evolutionary biology okay whereas christianity and islam come up with the wrong answer and it's a dogmatic answer and that answer cannot be challenged okay so that's where my point is everybody is dealing with the same phenomenon okay some come up with the right answer some come with wrong answer okay so that's why we can evaluate all of these things uh, i think this hijab issue as it has risen up just now is just uh, the thin edge of the, of the wedge they say or it is nothing but uh, the testing of the weaknesses which a normal jihadi would do they are testing the weaknesses in our society and how we will respond to these uh, issues i would like to have your comment on this oh indeed in fact there was a us air force study uh, that was published an article that was published uh, i think 2 years what was 3 years back uh, by an egyptian american uh, muslim himself and uh, he pointed out he said hijab is actually uh passive terrorism okay so in a way it is about encroaching the public space and uh, then telling the people look i don't care about your civil society i ca- don't care about your norms i don't care about your laws okay i am going to impose hijab on you now the girls who are doing that themselves may be uh, just victims okay who are brainwashed definitely i see the case with 16 17 year old children you know who are brainwashed by mullahs and even by the families to do that they may themselves be victims but the expression itself is one of passive terrorism is one of telling uh, look i don't give a damn to your society and uh, i am going to impose my islamic beliefs on you 
that's what it is